go live with you. Okay. Wow, there is a lot of you people. Okay, we are connecting. Yay! Yay! We did it. <laughs> so, all you guys, this one is very much for us as much as it is for you. It's the first time that we have an hour where we can really talk about our stories. And uh, I thought that uh, my life was wild. Uh, this lady is as wild as me and some, and the big difference between us, behind the 10 years uh, age difference, Mila was traveling with a kid. And I did that only uh, later on. And it changed everything in India. How are you, Mila? I'm very good. And yes, it was magic to be traveling with a kid. It opened all the doors in India. <laughs> it's all over Asia. It's so, so, so different. And yeah. I want to say something to everybody. Don't think that what we did is so special. We just make one choice. We gave everything to be able to get out of Europe and travel and be free, free. That has no price. So if you really want to do what we did, but you can sell all your stuff and go like, like we did. Mila had the chance to be able to go to India through, uh, by land, like I couldn't already. Iran and Iraq war at my time was really, really hard. And the first time I arrived in, uh, at the Khyber Pass, the Russian war has been on for, uh, for a little while. So Mila, can you tell us what it was to actually travel over land to go to, uh, to, go to India? I must say at that time I was quite interested in philosophy and uh, what life was about. And I'd heard something about Hinduism and Buddhism. And uh, yeah, so that seemed a good place to go. And uh, we set off. I had, uh, I think, 600 uh, guilders and $500, something like that. And that was it. And we started off in our van, but then we argued with the people who had the van, so, which was actually <laughs> our van. And it's we got out of our van <laughs> <laughs> and continued hitchhiking. Gave everything away to some gypsies that happened to be there that was in the van, and uh, we each had one shoulder bag, my daughter and me, and off we went. First, we uh, took a train to um, uh, Istanbul, which was really an amazing city it in those is. days. Uh, we spent most of our traveling uh, days passing through the pudding shop and going to the big blue mosque there, and... Um, but the people were so nice. I don't wave around so much. <laughs> 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 She's moving the phone around. <laughs> By the way, have a look at her, because this is Malouz, the, the daughter. <laughs> the one who travel. <laughs> the daughter I had when I was 19, and she accompanied me as a three-year-old. And uh, I didn't like going through Tira, uh, Iran, and I think at that time, there had been some national disaster. Everybody was very tense. And it was the first place it was not nice to be traveling as a young woman. I mean, in the end, I covered up from here to here to my toes. But that wasn't even enough. And I spent a lot of time just sitting in the hotel room and only going out to get uh, food. I'm pretty much like what I'm doing right now, actually. <laughs> I'm only going out to get food. Yeah, all, all the people I've known from that time uh, say the same. All this uh, Iran, Iraq was really painful. Uh, it cha Never. Everything changed when you arrived in Afghanistan. <laughs> when we arrived in Afghanistan, it was immediately magic. Somehow our bus turned back and we ended up walking the last mile in complete darkness and there were some lights ahead and that was from the Afghan chai shops 
there was a, a small square with about 20 Afghani chai shops. And when we sat down as foreigners, I was actually traveling with the seven other guys that happened to be sitting on the bus. And we sat down in one of the chai shops and the custom officials came over and they donated their own uh, hash to put in our hubbly bubbly. And they actually <laughs> said, welcome to Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> and we smoked together. Uh, next morning, we continued the bus to Herat, which was, I don't know, I, I would imagine it was more like a Western town out in the States when uh, people were just moving over there. It was all very primitive. <laughs> The most uh, spectacular thing was they had these luminescent drinks in bottles that all had a marble at the top <laughs> to keep the pressure in. <laughs> How many bottles we broke because my kids loved the marbles. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those dudes? <laughs> we uh, flew up to uh, mazar sharif There was no way could, we could go by road. Some people had gotten lost and... Uh, it was still pretty wild. It's huge wild. Our own uh, kind of physical wildness in Iran. Uh, that was not nice. That was 68. This was 1968, yes. Mazar-e Sharif was totally magic. There were no cars. There was a little uh, um, donkey cart that took us to the hotel from the airport. <laughs> it was just very primitive. No Coca-Cola. That was the first country, no Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> but the people were so amazing. And uh, I think, personally, I think it's because we all smoked together that there was this immediate uh, bond and friendship. And they would invite you to your ho their houses and prepare great dinners. And that yeah, was just a very magic place. And especially the people were so warm and welcoming. I, I, a few, this was uh, before the Russians came, before anybody came. Okay, everybody walked around with a gun and probably had, had lots of them had a shoulder strap full of bullets. <laughs> but I never felt threatened at all, at all. And it was really amazing. It's true, like very, when we, I, I, I was uh, stopped at the, at the Khyber Pass and we went to Landikota in Pakistan. Uh, the, the, it was 1980, the one had been on for uh, a few months, and it, it was weird. All those people with the, the bullet belt, ta -ta -ta, they're all big on top of it, and those machine gun and stuff, it was like, whoa! But they were all super nice. Yeah, it's yeah, cool. I never felt threatened, and, and nobody tried to bump into your tits or touch your ass, nothing. They were a lot of respect, it's true. Yeah. Then uh, the Khyber Pass, yeah, was the first place we actually reached. It was bloody cold. There was about 30 trucks there all going down into Pakistan. We could buy hash for $20 a kilo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> then still with the same seven guys I was traveling with, we got on the bus into uh, down to Pakistan. And then it was decided, yeah, I would go and sit in the front with everybody's hash in my bag with my daughter and a towel to cover the hash. And sure enough, when we got to the border, uh, they carried my bag over to the custom official. He'd never seen a blonde girl with blue eyes. He was totally <laughs> fascinated and gave us tea and cookies. Well, in the meantime, the whole bus is getting trashed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, very special. That was uh, very nice also. And then suddenly, after the barren landscape of uh, um, Afghanistan, there was just a profusion of green and birds and colors and and those brightly colored dresses the women wore and even the um, the children and everything yeah. the colors of the rainbow yeah that was very nice but at that moment i couldn't wait to get to india that was my goal and uh, we met up with some local uh, actually with a dutch couple and traveled on together and the first place in India we went to, 
after having a look at the Golden Temple, we went up to Kulu Manali Valley. The Golden Because Temple we... is so amazing. Yes. Oh. And at that time in Kulu, they had their uh, Mela. So, Dushira Mela. So, thousands What's of the people timing? came. And some had walked for weeks, and the costumes of all the different people coming from everywhere had different shoes, different hair, everything was different. The local the different people. processions from the different gods coming. Yeah, yeah no, no, I've, seen, I've, I've been to the Mela, it's so cool. Every village yeah. comes to the main valley, every village has a different pattern for the hat, every man, every village, it's a special pattern, every yeah. woman has a different pattern on their blanket and they wear Blanket around their body, Patu. it's like oh, the strongest woman in the world. They're so amazing. <laughs> I mean, patus, these blankets are incredible, huh? It's like one big pocket inside a pocket inside. They can put everything in there, everything including there. the kids oh, it's crazy. and the kitchen sink. <laughs> no, it was magical. Arriving for me, I didn't like India until I came to the mountain. Where well, we went everything to was really different, yeah. And we walked up to uh, Manali, on not where the roadside was, but on the other side. On the Nagar side. On, By the, the Nagar road. side? Yeah. Nagar Maybe was, that was the other year. Uh, and we walked, and it took us like a week or ten, ten days and stopped in every temple. And uh, all the children would come and would want my daughter to bless them. So <laughs> it was a whole ritual every time. And we stayed in the temple with the sadhus, chillums for breakfast. Uh, it was just a magic time. It's a, it's a crazy life. It was so magic. I couldn't wait to see the rest of India at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> But I must say, yes, it didn't take very long to decide to come up back up to the mountains. Although in the meantime, we went to Goa in 68, the winter of 68, 69. I think there was about 10 people there. Travelers. And you know, Eddie Eightfinger was already there. He was one of the yeah. first. Eddie, Eddie Eightfinger. Eddie was there, but he hadn't moved to Anjuna yet the first year. Mm -hmm. And Mescaline came... Bobby was there too? Not yet. Not that okay. first year. No, but yeah. Mary was there. Okay. No, yeah. and you made Mary... the school in Goa. That's blow me away when I read that. Ah, yeah, yeah that was Because it's so though. damn cool, that school in Goa. Yeah. Yeah, but in the beginning, nobody had music. People sat all night and played a flute and a tabla or just a kitchen pot and made their own music. I remember one night we got, we'd gotten a candle from the church there and it burnt all night and we just all sat around and meditated. <laughs> there was no electricity in Goa when we arrived. No, the yeah. houses didn't have electricity. Nothing. Year by year, we watched the lights come. The first beach... How that uh, the first electric that hit the beach was which one? At the tourist hotel, probably. Yeah, the tourist hotel in Kalangut. Yeah. yeah. And then it took a year or two years even to get to Baga, where we were up by Tito's. Yeah. But yeah. then it's like 70, yeah? That's when we first had electric. Yeah. Yeah. For me, Goa the first time was a weird uh, experience. Because it's not India, and no. people have a weird attitude there. No, they didn't in '68. They loved us then, and they had this uh, party every year from all the fishermen and everybody, and they danced together. But they did these skits on how they saw us in the foreigners. <laughs> which was hilarious. <laughs> It was something they did traditionally every year, but. After a year or two of watching us, I remember because uh, our neighbors were part of it. And the boys dressed up like some of us girls, but they used coconuts, uh, you know, like empty coconuts. <laughs> and they had the the stuff. It was crazy, man. And then about five years later, the Dutch Balloon Company started putting on these shows where they were doing all these skits. And this like... <laughs> We know this one. They were doing that there already when we got there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, God became very special to me, but 
once I knew the people. And it was already the, nine, the 80s when I went there. So it was yeah. wild. It yes. was really, really, yes. really wild. It got wilder wild. every year. <laughs> Goa has never been the same. I managed for many years to come back every year, and it was never the same place. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's like, I, I remember people telling me that Goa was not it anymore. And uh, yeah, it was in the 70s or the 60s, but the 80s were bloody amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were quite amazing before then also. Uh, but uh, when you lived in India, like we did, going to Goa was a holiday. You know, it was like a holiday from living in India. No, and, and, and you lived also in, uh, in northern India. You live in... Uh, Most of the time. Most summers we stand up in the Himalayas. You went to school with the Lama, huh? <laughs> <laughs> my daughter, she uh, did uh, some artwork with the Lamas. But my kids ended up going to an international school because I felt... Uh, they needed some education. It, it, when, they, really... when you reach seven, eight years old, yeah, you need uh, you need to uh, you need to know the game to be able to play it with everybody else. Basically, I, uh, uh, I had a school there earlier in Goa, and you get like twelve-year-olds that had never ever didn't know A, B. What was that? No, but you know, there is a, there is a Waldorf school that there is very much like that, huh? My daughter had hardly any uh, background uh, academic when she went to ninth grade, eighth grade, and she rocked it because <laughs> her brain was ready to absorb that type of data at that time. It's like they... Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to go into the school system. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's like you manage so well because kids need stability, but they love diversity at the same time. It's all new and fun. To be yeah. able to, uh, to travel like you did with no money, basically, most of the time, and uh, yeah, being able yeah. to, uh, to handle the, the demand of a kid. You, you, need, you need more stability. You need... You need a school, you need a place where to, uh, to stay that uh, there is a, a, a nurturing environment always uh, around them, even if it's an uh, unusual one. <laughs> I don't know, I always felt wherever I was with the kids, that was our home. <laughs> if they learn, I mean, when, you, when it's a way of life, and they're part of it. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the the world was our, our oyster. Everywhere we went was home yeah. because yeah. people were welcoming us. You know what I mean? It's like when everybody welcome you like that. It's uh, in the it's, beginning. Uh, in the beginning, the attitude was they were really happy that there were some younger tourists coming that were really interested in India. And uh, that was before that I discovered the word hippie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they started to teach that word in school in 76, before 75, before that it didn't exist. Then they started to teach it in school, in Indian schools. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> After the movie, dum -a dum Oh, that's about Kathmandu and uh, <laughs> Bombay. And Bombay and the freaks there. You, you have movies. grown on Indian movie? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's hard to... Uh, it, it would be really hard to describe uh, an Indian movie theater in, uh, in the 60s, 70s and the movie and the crowd in, uh, in the theater. It's... Uh, it's a show in itself. Uh, you don't go to see the movie, you go to see the people watching the movie. <laughs> yeah, we saw Barbarella sometime in New Delhi. 
I'm Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I'm Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I forget <laughs> about that, but anyway, yeah, so my kids got some education. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you manage not to make ash when you were in a, in a mountain in India and Afghanistan and Pakistan? Of course. Yeah, we helped. Uh, that's what the local people were doing, especially up in Manali. We were all rubbing together. I started rubbing when I was four. Yeah, we ah. would be very lazy. We'd send the kids out. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'd send did. the kids out to do the rubbing. <laughs> <laughs> so you did. No, because it's like, for me, before knowing who you were, I used water for the first time. And ah. because I had such a background of dry CVing, for me it was a revelation. It's like, it's, I, I consider what you created the only evolution in sieving cannabis resin. Yeah. Bringing the water in a game that uh, dude from... Uh, Leytonville from Norcal was a great idea, but it's not new. But no, you they did... had the idea, but I made the first bag, even though That's I it. it's like the because... water was something, but to be able to sieving is made of two process. You agitate to detach the gland and separate. you separate over your your sieve. You say you made those two process separated it changed everything the ability to control well, first, i think maybe even the biggest change was the pollinator the dry sift because yeah people made hash for thousands of years but it was always a manual job that was the very first mechanical system to separate crystals i guess so yeah before that also we were working on screens on tables and things like that no yeah Yeah, but I mean, look at the Afghans. The Afghans, they work on a screen, huh? They have, yeah, the yeah. screen is They super big. They're working on the screen. <laughs> My brilliant idea came when I was standing in front of the clothes dryer. Because when we were do, having the material on the screen, you'd kind of fluff it up a bit so the crystals would fall through the screen. And then suddenly I saw my clothes in the clothes dryer doing exactly that. So I thought, oh my God, I'm going to put a screen <laughs> around a drum and put this stuff inside. And it bloody well worked. <laughs> and we still make them. In fact, we have a lot of orders for them right now. <laughs> I, I, and like for a lot of people who want to do uh, rosin now, where the yeah. cleanliness of the, of the resin gland is not massively important, it's a great solution. Yeah. You may not get as much as you would get with water, but uh, for people dealing in a, in serious quantity, uh, that's a, a huge, huge solution. Huh? And if you want it cleaner, you just have to use a little bit of uh, static electricity and you can have some amazing product. Huh? Yeah, you can put them through another screen also to uh, separate all the stuff you don't want in there. <laughs> Yeah, you just want the crystals. No, the only... Uh, I've seen people who added uh, cryogenic to, uh, to the tumbler, and I don't think it's really smart. Because it's... It what? Cryogenic cold. So, that, like, super cold. But it makes ah, the like material from, even uh, more brittle. From dry ice. Oh, it's not even no, dry ice. There is like the, it's like a gas coming inside the tumbler. It, it's too yeah, cold. This uh, dry ice um, it makes the whole plant cold, and so all the leaves immediately crumble. What well, if you separate with dry ice only the first thirty seconds, one minute, you get crystals, and after that it just goes completely green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I, 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 I tell everybody dry ice is. You make a brittle material even more brittle. So it's, uh, yeah. you want cold? Don't Why like don't you uh, do it in, it a, in a walk-in fridge? The yeah. fridge temperature are good, like cold. Yes. yes. But not freezing at that level. You hurt the material, literally. Huh? Yeah. 
No, everything. It's like uh, when they put a rose in dry ice, so you tap it and the whole rose crumbles. And that's what it does to the marijuana that's what, plant. Uh, the exactly. Plant yeah. <laughs> no, basically with your tumbler, you need, you, need, uh, you need the material not to be overly dry. And if the material is not over, like too old or too dry, dry yeah. it in a good condition, uh, where it's still soft, you can have some great stuff in with a serious return in uh, in the tumbler. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what's made in a tumbler uh, pollinator is also great for uh, making rosin from, because especially uh, when now they do all this uh, fresh frozen and if you dry sift that and then make rosin it's just amazing it's amazing it's so transparent. but to dry sift that you have to be crazy <laughs> <laughs> but i know people you you need to work in a very 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 cold room like a like yeah. a, a walk-in freezer almost if you go back to my the flowers here from my own garden camellias oh uh, yeah Oh, you have the garden at uh, in uh, in Amsterdam. Oh, nice. <laughs> a little, little tiny garden where not really much sun ever comes. It's no good for <laughs> growing things at all. But uh, camellias, they never get sun, and they're just as big as my hand, just about. It's huge flower, yeah. 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 See, otherwise, how was uh, the Parvati Valley when you were there? You went to Manikaram when you were on yeah, your first trip. Yeah, we uh, the wrong way around. Well, we went uh, over the mountains from what was that place <laughs> called, where they have the castle. Yeah, no, we we heard that you had to go all the way back to Patliko from Mani from Manali. Mm -hmm. Mila decided that she would take a shortcut, so she went straight up to the top of the valley on the other side from Manali, and decided she'd walk down along the top of the ridge. And then just cut down into the next valley, you know, and come down behind Nagar. Yeah, yeah, well, that's Malana. You tell them about the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> the first night, thank goodness, we ran into the first afternoon, we ran into the shepherds, and they were there with sheep and water buffaloes and a whole bunch of big wolves with these metal collars with nails sticking out. Look very ferocious. <laughs> we didn't really realize what all that was for till at night we were sleeping by the campfire and I wake up and it sounds like I'm next to a waterfall and it turns out hundreds of sheep were all pissing out of fear at the same time because of a group of wolves. This was the first fresh meat coming up the valley that springtime. Oh, wow. They're all around there. Oh, wow. And uh, from the big uh, fire in the middle, the guys picked out big burning branches and ran around all the animals and the dogs with their metal rings. And uh, I think nobody, uh, they didn't get anything, but it was very uh, intense. It's pretty wild there, huh? There's a lot of bear. Yeah, when we were trekking, we also one time uh, came across wolves. Well, they came across us at night. <laughs> and then there was just four of us. But at that time, we'd just come from Leh in Ladakh, uh, where we bought these uh, uh, cookery knives that they use in uh, Nepal for chopping wood, for chopping everything. Yeah. So there we sat with a little campfire because there is there is no wood there. You're tracking above the tree line. So whatever wood you have, around. probably uh, one of the beams from a bridge. <laughs> we used to take those. <laughs> it would burn well. But, um, yeah, very little fire. And there's this group of wolves. And all you could see was their eyes. That was very frightening. So frightening that our horses ran away. We had yeah. horses the second year we went trekking. They ran away in the night, so what happens? The horseman goes after them with, oh, with Hans. No, no, the, we got them to come back because <laughs> he was going on his own and we said, yeah, the horses can run fast, but you can't outrun all those wolves. <laughs> <laughs> so we forced him to come back. And then the first, next morning at first light, he set off and he came back around lunchtime and none of the horses, even the fall, all the horses were there we packed up and he just wanted to get out of there. He wanted to get out of there. 
And sure enough, about five miles down the road, there was a or path. There was no roads there. It was just a horse path. Uh, there was uh, this donkey half eaten and a full donkey also half eaten. The wolves had gotten them. So we were lucky that night. Yeah, that can be quite uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but we, because we were so crazy, I mean, it's like unequipped in the Himalayan mountain. I mean, it's like, and it's like, yeah, let's go to the next valley, sure, why not? And uh, the pass well, is like 4,000 feet. They had, uh, spring. they had a hot spring in Manica, and that was the big draw. So we wanted to go to the hot springs. We'd already seen Pashish. And this one was supposed to be even better. Oh, yeah, so, it is. <laughs> luckily, luckily, the Gujas gave us instructions how to walk. And we came down by the end of the afternoon on the second or third yeah, day. Yeah, we got come in this valley first and then up another ridge and then yeah. down. And then we arrived at Manikar and just at dusk. At Milana. Oh, hmm? at Milana. Milana. Yeah, at Milana. But yeah, in first you days, go to Milana. Then from Milana, you go down to the Parvati. Exactly. So we've arrived at dusk and it's just starting to rain. There's <laughs> nobody out because it's raining. So what do we do? Hey, there's houses there. So we go and we go and sit down on the porch of the first house we see. But, yeah. Everybody runs out of the house screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and we're left completely in shock. We don't know anything. Yeah. Mila is about 24 at this point. She's only been in Manali, we hadn't even been down to the rest of India yet. She knew, we knew nothing. Turns out that, uh, and yeah, even if you know a lot, Malana is very, it's special, it's unique. There is no other place in the world like that. No. Yeah, no, it was in yeah, They were quite isolated. Uh, they, they had their own little kingdom, their own. Uh, and it wasn't until the 90s, I think, that the Indian government forced them to vote. It's not so long ago. It's yeah, the last yeah. democracy on earth, Malala. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they uh, say their ancestors are maybe some of the leftovers from Alexander's army that found a nice valley and decided to stay and mix with the locals. And yeah, they yeah. quite in dread uh, when we got there. There is other... Well, it's, uh, there is many stories about them. Alexander the Great is the least... Uh, yeah. But they're, they're pretty, I mean, this is the most amazing hair. people I've lived with. They are so strong. Yeah. And they live in such an amazing, special place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our first contact, they were scared as shit of us. They didn't want to have anything to do with us. And in reality, a lot of the people had pockmarks on their face. So this is what Mila put it down to at the time. Well, it turns out that the last foreigners who had been there were the British in the British days, and they had bought pox, uh, the pox and Small everything, uh. smallpox and everything. So they didn't want nothing to do with any more foreigners. Anybody. No. Even even the people from Kulu were considered foreigners. Yeah, everybody is foreigners for Malala. The only connection yeah. they have, it's with the Nagar village, the, the Brahmin from the Nagar village. Yeah. Everybody else, they just low class, they don't want to know about them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and in the 60s, must have been even more. In the 80s, was kind of a, a not end, so well we, uh, kept secret anymore, you know? In the end, they let us sleep in a cow shed uh, that belonged to a shopkeeper. And he sometimes went down to Kulu to buy stuff for his shop, I guess. And then, man, we stood like, Five, 10 yards away from his shop and said we wanted beaties and candies and so he brought them out and put them down and we went forward and put down the money and picked <laughs> up the stuff and then he came forward and picked up the money and yeah. came out it was like <laughs> it's actually yeah. the same idea yeah, it, I mean, it was the same for me in the 80s huh? in yeah. the village so it was cool. always yeah. like that yeah. Outside so the village, they would touch and they, they would be a little bit more friendly. Yeah. But in the village, it's all a question of uh, yeah. appearance, really. But the nature was so beautiful. And then we climbed the next day, we climbed another whole ridge. And then at dusk, we arrived at Manikarn, which is this temple. 
in quite this deep part of the valley and also no electricity there but there were hundreds of little um deers these little deers the oil lamps little oil lamps like uh, about two inches across mm -hmm. so there was hundreds of little lights all over this temple it was like right like arriving somewhere in in, in uh <laughs> Fairy tale. Fairy tale. It was so magical. Yeah. And then all the sadhus, they were there, and they were all sitting around this pool where they were boiling their rice inside it. It was so hot. And then we all went bathing, I remember, and I was so sore. And the ladies' one was all covered up, which was quite nice. And the water was so warm. Oh, it was great. Then we slept out on the hot rocks around the pool with the sadhus and everybody else there. Yeah, that was a really, and then in the morning, ah, uh, then you tell us, yeah, chanting, <laughs> and doing the yoga, and yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. It's a very special. That Parvati Valley is so special. I am not yeah. sure I want to go back there because they made six, seven, eight dam in uh, since then, yeah. and Malana is, has been so touristic that uh, they stopped bringing people there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like their temple burned. This is, they had the oh, strongest, and, and Malawi, uh, yes, yes. they had the, the strongest deftat from the whole northern uh, India. Their temple burned. They have been doing a lot of bad stuff for that to happen. Huh? Yeah. And since then, the whole half the village burned. And since then, They got rid of all their beautiful wooden houses, or a lot of them, and put up all these concrete blocks. I know. It seems the, 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 the metal the, roof. Oh, to oh. live in a piece of concrete. I know. Oh, the metal roof when it was all big stone, and it was so... It, it, it felt like being not on Earth anymore, almost, uh, living there for months. Yeah, you can disconnect uh, totally we 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 stay the whole season at the end of the of the summer pasture really like the end and white chin i remember the name i think especially when we came there in the 60s it was still pretty much exactly the same as it had been for the last 500 years oh yeah you know and then uh, i came, went back there in uh, 2011 12 or something And in those 35 years, there were more changes, I'm sure, than in the preceding 500 years. Was... Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. For, them to, uh, for them to make guest house on yeah. their lawn, when you cannot touch their house, and they have other people taking care of it so that they can make the business, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, their, uh, their temple burn out. Because this yeah. is as bad as it gets. Huh? Yeah, it's like, wow. I would have never thought they would go that far. When I was there, you could stay in one place, Santuram. It's like the low caste family. And you wouldn't stay long there because you stay in one room with the wife, the, the, the Santuram, and the three or four kids. You know what I mean? It's like you would go up by uh, Charas and go down the valley the following day. Nobody stayed. Uh, yeah. We were few to stay in the 80s, uh, like maybe three groups of foreigners. We were the only one at the end of the valley. And you know, when you, on, when you look at the Parvati Shino. Valley, yeah. Yeah. there is that mountain with a flat part where there is a lot of field. Yeah. Maybe 30 minutes, an hour from a walk from Malana. That was already taken by other people. To make charas on that uh, on that platform, I I, I I I think I have never had a view like that. Eagles flying, and it's like oh. I think on those uh, early trips, if we felt like a joint, we would just look around and rub some and make the joint. <laughs> it's magic. It's I mean I. Uh, I, I wish I, I had known more about the history now to appreciate even even more. But that that magic of this mountain, 
it's 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 not only the plant growing there it's uh, it's the whole culture uh, the every village is amazing the people the way they live uh, i have a lot of friends who were literally spending the even the winter there huh? they marry local women and uh, and they just yeah. live there yeah yeah no we came in the summer with the kids uh, we didn't spend the winter up there we went down to goa <laughs> that was our holiday <laughs> so when you when you did your trek what time of the year was it Well, we had to wait till the first pass uh, was snow free. The Rotan. The Rotan Pass. So that was like, I think, in July sometime. Yeah, May it opens around June. June, July. Uh. Yeah. And then the first year we did, we just carried our own stuff and we walked up to Leh. That's 500 kilometers. Then I took photographs and uh, we managed to get a published article on it in Holland and Then we had money for my husband at that time to get a film camera, and uh, we were going to go off and <coughs> make uh, films and documentaries. But mm. uh, in the end, he didn't like it up there. He wanted to be in Holland. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that first movie, poof. Yeah, it's a shame because there is not that many people who would have the mean to keep to keep those memories. There is very few really good photograph and film uh, of those day in uh, in Nepal, Afghanistan, uh, India. There is very like I wish there were had been more people like uh, Lawrence Cherniak. But it was against you. Uh, you know Lawrence Cherniak? Yes, yes. Did but you make it? It was Travis? against our uh, religion, kind of, to have a camera. <laughs> I, 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 we have never been really uh, a photo guy, and I would have Very said few. when I had one in India, I didn't feel comfortable to uh, to take yeah. pictures of people. No, no. You know what I mean? And uh, not only uh, Indian local people, but uh, but foreigners. It's like we didn't carry stuff like that because. Everything was so yeah, illegal. Yeah, you didn't say yeah. nothing. Yeah, I'm sure no, that you had to... so much to put uh, so many pictures and so much that you uh, that you can share with us now. I wish I. Uh... I know, I know, especially in Afghanistan. They did the film. I always say when I was in that plane there, every single person in that plane was worthy of a photograph in the National Geographic. Every single person. <laughs> did you did you actually finish your documentary? Um, the, we made two hours of documentary. Then he never did anything to it to turn it into a movie until my sister came along, and then she made a film and used part of his After footage. He died. Okay, yeah. that's that's uh, the movie. Uh, okay. That's as parts of his That's movie. Uh, yeah, we well, have two it, hours of footage from that movie. Uh, is it uh, available so somewhere? Hmm? Is it available somewhere? Can people look at it? No, I, no, I have to uh, put it together. <laughs> oh yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> no, it would be awesome because, like I say, there is so little. Yeah. Like yeah, but this is memory, like so many memory, like that. Okay, shameless little plug here. Um, you must know Anders, no? Sorry? Anders has Anders, uh, Missing Inca. Okay. Missing Inca, uh -huh. he has a website with loads of photographs. Many people have been saving it on there. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, no, I've so seen a little people? bit on Facebook also. I even yeah. seen a bunch of people, a picture of me that I did not even know that existed, actually. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, now we like to see them. At the time, if we saw a camera at a party, we would you... all freak out. Oh, I know, I know. And now I really wish so bad that I, uh, I would have taken the picture or well, not lost have... uh, the film uh, and, the, and the picture. It's a... Uh, 
I mean, it's like it was so uncool and bad to smoke in our time that we were into protection mode. We were not into uh, protecting a, a, a culture. We were into protecting ourselves from society, basically. Yeah. Well, it was also a symbol of the uh, society that personally I in 68 was trying to get away from. I yeah, to, yeah, the same for me. I, I, I'm, I'm a trying to experience in the world when you're 17 years right. old. And you so just experience something that makes you super, super happy. Like uh, since you were a kid, you had not been so happy. And everybody is telling you that not only it's bad what you do for yourself, but it's, it's bad for your family and your friend and everybody you touch. It's like you, uh, you're going to make, you're going to make them feel pain because of what you're doing. It's like when you're 17 years old, it's really hard to take that type of guilt when it's not part of your reality. The only way to, to manage that is to go in producing country where it's different. I didn't even know about uh, hash or weed when I was 17. I had my first smoke when I was 21. Came from the harbor here in Amsterdam. That's why you have to score your <laughs> dope in those days. Oh, and I thought I was a latecomer. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was 65, maybe. No, it's, it's a, yeah, 66. 65, Did, 66. You went to Morocco also? Yeah, one time ever. Yeah. Did, did you go also, to my own? I went on my own and I hitchhiked. <laughs> uh, did you go to uh, Morocco after or before India? Before. Okay. I went in 65. They were not making ash? In India, I hitchhiked. I went there in 68. Were so they making was, ash? There was no ash there then. They only had, uh, they had uh, Keef which was uh, uh, chopped up little buds with black tobacco chopped up together and then they would put it. We are now live and 